Hi guys, Jonathan here with what is actually the final in a series of episodes on Stirling Rifles. That's the Stirling Armament Corporation of Dagenham, Essex, UK. Famous, of course, for the Stirling submachine gun um, designed by George Patchett. Um, and the sort of ongoing narrative here is that Stirling are looking for, through the 70s, 80s, a, their own design of infantry rifle. So they've managed to license the uh, Armalite AR-18 and AR-180 and the um, little shorty S version. That's quite a successful product for them, licensed from Armalite. They can't license that onto other countries, which is one of the main things that they'd like to do. So they are trying in parallel to develop um, Frank E. Waters' design, the light automatic rifle. Now that emerges in the 70s. We've got a video on that one. It morphs into the SAR-80, the Sterling Assault Rifle, or Singapore Assault Rifle, Model 80, which we've got another video on, so have, have a look at that, that as well. Um, that they were sort of hoping would be a rival to the SA-80, but I think they must have known that um, the SA-80 being the government-backed horse in the race was really the only game in town. So I don't think they seriously expected to compete with either the LAR or the SAR-80, or SAR-80 if you prefer. So that became a Singaporean rifle, uh, went to Somalia and a few other countries, and is the most successful of this lineage. It reverted to a lot of AR-18 features from the slightly more exotic, dare I say, left field <laughs> LAR. But um, Frank and the gang were not finished. They went back to the LAR design and created the SAR-87, which is what's in front of me. They the literature talks, well, so that's um, promotional brochures. We'll show you one of those, uh, or, well, leaflets, really. Uh, it appears in Jane's Infantry Weapons, 1988-89, and they talk about a folding stock version for paratroopers, which they had developed for the LAR. Um, that's never designed, as far as we know. Uh, most of the material shows a concept drawing, not, not even a real gun, or that even in, in Jane's 1988-89, it says that it's in a state of advanced development, which I think is pushing it rather. And then it disappears for reasons that I'll explain at the end. So, uh, two main configurations that exist, um, although you can make a third by removing the carrying handle. This one, this rifle here is already missing that. And we have several, so they're actually Two off to my left and two here, four in total. They aren't significantly different. Um, different finishes, different handguards. So we'll briefly go over the features of this design. So starting with the earlier type. So this one is serial number four. Um, in a moment, we'll take apart serial number one because it's the only one that comes apart. Let me just show you the markings on the receiver there, stamped in. So just to prove to you that is, this is um, serial number four. And sterling markings on there as well. But other markings consist of purely of selector markings and they are standard um, Armalite type selector markings. The trigger groups are rather different on this. You'll see that when I uh, take it apart for you. We have a number of controls. The magazine release on the left hand side so you can grab it with your Activate it with your thumb and, and pull the magazine out. We've seen this in, in various designs. The touchstone here is always the AR-18. We've got a bolt hold open catch here. We have a non-reciprocating cocking handle, reminiscent of that on the SLR, the L1A1, the FAL, which is a departure from the previous Waters designs. Those had um, AR-18 style fixed cocking handles on, on the other side. So that's a step forward, you, you might say. Sighting arrangements are, again, very derivative of, of AR-18 in terms of, well, standard adjustable front post and two-position flip rear sight with very armor-like, uh, sorry, AR-18-style protectors. There is the ability to fit the carrying handle, which I'll show you in a moment. The receiver is a single stamping or pressing, as, as we used to say in the UK. Except that there's a detachable trigger group, which again we'll come back to. The butt stock is a solid piece of polymer, nylon, I believe it is, 
so is the pistol grip. The furniture's not standardised on any of these. Um, in fact, the, the front handguard is two pieces of wood. Now, it does have a heat shield fitted to it, so it's not as quite as rudimentary as it looks, but clearly at this era, the final handguard would have been made of a polymer. We've got a, an adjustable gas block up the, up the front here, and a simple circle clip here keeps it in place, and you adjust it if it'll move. This one won't move. Um, we have one that will move, I'll show you in a moment, but it's marked 0, 1 and 2 for gas off for launching grenades, 1 for normal operation, 2 for adverse operation in you know, dirty or difficult conditions. The muzzle device is a little unusual. It's a departure from the birdcage of the Armalite rifles with ports drilled um, all around, so there's no kind of compensating effect or anything. If anything, the ports... Yeah, I don't, there's no sort of compensation effect here, I don't think. I think it's just a form of a flash suppressor. There's also a bayonet lug, of course. This is being a military rifle. You generally can't sell, you certainly couldn't in the 1980s, sell a military rifle without a bayonet attachment. So it's actually an M16 pattern bayonet. This is one from the Canadian DeMarco, C7, C8. Because we don't... The Sterling did not make M16 pattern bayonets, as far as I know. Only the um, number five type. Simple as that, M16 bayonet. What we do have that's a, a positive and a modern feature is an ambidextrous safety selector. It's on both sides, which is, of course, what ambidextrous <laughs> means. Now, that's, um, so that makes this not truly ambidextrous. You have, of course, all the other controls are only on, on the left side. Otherwise, ergonomically, well, it's a little chunky. Weight is, you know, what you might expect, sort of eight-ish pounds, something like that. Uh, this furniture definitely needed more work. It's, it's excessively chunky. Which brings me to the other variant. Um, another departure, actually, from the earlier, or from the LAR, at least, is, um, is a lack of a sliding dust cover. This just uses the, the bolt carrier to seal the gap, which is probably good enough, I think. And here is this carrying handle. You could either fit a, I believe this is a Weaver pattern rail. This would, uh, is, is either on the carry handle or you could apparently mount it straight to the receiver. I'm not sure how, we don't have a version that has that, but the brochure tells you that you can do that. And then the other, only other change on this type, apart from the British military Suncorite paint finish rather than the gray phosphate, is this slimmer, more advanced looking handguard but it's still made of painted wood. I think this would have been the prototype for a version in polymer. I'm not quite sure why the front, why the handguard is wood and the butt stocks are always polymer, except that it's easier to carve nylon into a blocky shape than this. And the shape of both handguards is relatively intricate with grasping grooves and vent holes and things like that. Uh, but I'm starting to speculate there. That's the SAR 87 or the SAR 87. Um, let's take one apart and see how it's changed from the previous two designs. Okay, here it is. This is serial number one, SAR 87, and it's one that we can take apart, so let's have a look. So we start, as always, by removing the magazine. Simple catch that we just press and pull, a little awkward from this angle. We then also do need to cock it, which is normal, of course. Folding cocking handle. It's a bit small, a bit small and awkward. Could, of course, have been improved. So far, so normal. We then have this, um, this catch, which is a bit reminiscent of the cone hammer on a C96, now that I think about it. Just an easy way to grasp it. And that just presses downwards. Press that and rotate. So far, so good, except that the butt doesn't come off at all and it flaps about and gets in the way. So for the initial st st stage of uh, disassembly, turning it to this position is probably the best. We then press in and down on the recoil spring, on the recoil spring uh, back plate here 
And then <laughs> awkwardly, we need to give it a bit of a kick with the cocking handle so that it actually comes out. We can then rotate the butt out of the way. There is our recoil spring, guide rod, and securing plate. And that just hooks up and into the receiver there to secure it in place. Bit fiddly to put back in. Now, <laughs> the next challenging part is <laughs> that. Now, if it hadn't done that, I'd have had to have banged the butt on the table to get the bolt carrier group to come out. Not ideal, but it is a prototype. So we'll set that aside for the moment, but we will have a look at it in, in a moment because it's interesting. Um, the only other bit you would do, well, two bits <laughs> for stripping for cleaning, say, the handguards. So they come off with push in and half turn. And off they pop. There is a metal heat shield in there. You can see some old carbon from test firing. But these are carved wood, as you can see. And we could probably live with just leaving that one in place. You'll notice that there are two key holes here for handguard attachment. So they have been experimenting with different handguard designs that attach in different places. That's interesting. Sometimes looking at this stuff is a bit like archaeology. Um, which suits me, because that was what I trained to do originally. Um, now, so what can we see under here? Well, ignoring the, the, the bolt carrier itself just for the moment, the long piston rod here indicates that this is in fact a long stroke gas piston system, more like the Kalashnikov, where you have your operating rod attached to the bolt carrier, giving you more operating mass, potentially more, more reliability as a result. Only instead of a, a piston rings and a piston head on the end, like the AK, we've got a, a reverse piston, more like something like an AR-18. Now, uh, worth mentioning again that the light automatic rifle is down in at least one source as being long stroke. It's not. There's confusion there between the LAR and the SAR-87. Um, that confusion extends, I think, to the brief mention in the, the book, The Guns of Dagenham, in case you were wondering. Uh, there's another gun pictured in, a, in that book that appears to be an earlier prototype of the SAR-87 that we don't have. So, just thought I'd mention. So your, your gas is being tapped off, of course, um, at the barrel as normal. It's coming into this sort of inverse piston and it's forcing back the bolt carrier group in the normal fashion. The gas is adjustable, as mentioned, and it works with what the numbers read as, if that makes sense. So the lever up means gas off. The lever to the right, where you can see the one, means gas setting one, normal operation. And then lever down with the two uh, horizontal means adverse, uh, or maximum gas, turning it up to 11, as it were. And that's, that's the, those are the basics, except for you can remove the trigger group. So there's another takedown pin. And out drops a removable trigger group. Quite, quite neat in principle. Um, the trigger mechanism is classic stoner armalite with a slightly different shaped hammer. So you've got, uh, of course, the three positions of the, of the selector, dictating how these parts in the middle will function. The hammer. is a somewhat original design. Doesn't quite look like the AR-15 or the AR-18. We've got a, a notch on the bottom for operation um, of the safety sear or the automatic sear. So the final techie bit of this is how you uh, trip the mechanism so that it will, it will fire on its own on automatic. Uh, so that the bolt carrier is, fire is setting off the trigger, essentially. 
So in a Kalashnikov, there's a, there's a lever sticking up and the bolt overrides it, and it's only when the bolt does that that the hammer can fall. What you don't want is the hammer falling early, because then the gun won't work properly. And so the way that's done on the SAR87 is a bit bizarre. There's this plate here that that's it tripping. So what's activating that? Well, it's not the bolt coming forward, but it sort of is. But there's an intermediate step on this thing. And it is, if I can find something to poke with, <laughs> this plunger here, the tiny little plunger that I'm tapping there, on the other end of that, well, the bolt carrier overrides that. So that curved surface there, when that comes far enough forward, it bears on the other end of this little rod. And pressing down on that rod, obviously this is upside down, but pressing down on that rod presses down on this paddle here. So tripping the hammer, ready to be let go, either by uh, the trigger or by the bolt carrier. But there's this middle step. It's a little bizarre. I haven't seen a, a weapon that works quite like that, 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 like that before, which brings me to this weird bolt carrier. So we have this gubbins on the side here, which is not normal. And it's an anti-pre-engagement system is the technical term for it. All that means is that you don't want this, this bolt going in too soon, because otherwise these lugs won't be lined up and your gun won't shut properly. It will stop, the gun will stop firing. Now how that's dealt with on um, normal Armalite type rifles of both types, is the cam stud here runs in a shelf on the inside of the receiver. So the bolt can't turn until it can, if that makes sense. That's what that big bump on the left side of, a, of an AR-15 is. It's to accommodate the, uh, the cam pin once it's free to rotate, because it isn't free to rotate until it's shut. Very neat design. The, arm, the AR-18 does it in a slightly different way, but still uses a shelf. Why Sterling went for this overly complicated lever with an additional spring and an additional pin costing you more money I, I really don't know i'm sure there was a sound reason for it but i can't think of one we have abandoned the uh, patented friction fit extractor retaining system if you don't know what i mean go back and watch the previous videos we still have the tungsten weight in the bolt carrier, which is a good feature that stops the bolt from bouncing back when it slams shut and is a feature that um, caused some problems with SA80. We won't get into the, the, the long running rivalry between Enfield and Sterling, except to say that there was one and some accusations made. Um, but this was far too late to be a realistic rival to the SA80. It was only ever going to be available for export sales and unfortunately, this is a case of, it, this didn't just die on the vine, this ended because Sterling ended. Sterling armaments uh, wound up in 1988. So this thing narrowly squeaked into the 1988-89 issue of Jane's Infantry Weapons, and then it just died completely. Nobody else took over the design. To be fair, it's quite derivative of AR-18. Um, we have parallel designs like the Australian Leader, that carry on and, and do their thing. We have AR-18 inspired systems later on as well, but this parallel family relation of the, of the Armalite, it just didn't go anywhere. Um, we don't know how many were made, far less than 100, I would suggest. We only have uh, up like one to five, uh, sorry, one to four. <laughs> so there we are. And that brings us to the end of what's ended up being a bit of a series uh, within a series of, of what's this weapon, showing you uh, the fairly tortured history of the Sterling arm uh, company attempts to develop their own rifle. And that includes the tube, what you might call tube guns, the two rifles that we have that were attempts to, to make a Sterling submachine gun in style weapon in 7.62 NATO. And then the pivot to 5.56 when that became popular uh, and, the way, and, and was sort of the way forward for infantry rifles, where we get the light automatic rifle, then the, the SAR-80, which is, despite being a sort of stopgap in, in, in a way, the most, the, the best designed, dare I say, and the most popular of 
by far, the only one to see production of the Sterling Rifles. And then finally, the SAR-87 that you've just seen, which as the name implies, work began uh, in earnest in 1987, it's still in development in 88, and of course that's when the Sterling Company folds. That's not the entire end of the story, because a few years ago, James Edmiston, who was the CEO uh, when this was being developed, did revive the company, the company name, uh, and they are going again as an engineering company. Um, as far as I know, they've yet to develop any firearms, but hey, you never know, this might not be the end of the story, there might be another Sterling rifle in the offing. Um, watch this space, I suppose. Uh, we were fortunate at the Royal Armouries when the original company wound up that we did receive all of these really interesting prototypes. Um, we have a very, very good collection of the submachine gun and its spin-off carbines and pistols and things. And um, another thing that might just show up in future on this series. But that's it for the Sterling rifles. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this. As always, guys, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, you can actually, if you'd like to, donate to us. Uh, we have a, if you check out the website, there's a way to do that. Um, we just mainly want you to <laughs> subscribe and like and do all of that YouTube stuff. Um, you can also check out our, as well as the website, our social media channels. Uh, they're all linked from the website anyway. Um, and very importantly, we'd like you to visit us. Um, we are a museum at the end of the day, or, well, several museums. Tower of London, Fort Nelson, and here in Leeds. So if you're in the UK, um, and even if you're not, if you're on vacation or something, please do come and see us. We'd love to see you. Thanks a lot.